basically the definition shows a distant retrograde orbit was to ensure that the um, we didn't leave a, a cloud of debris as uh, someone mentioned but also it's a very stable orbit that could allow the rock to be uh, in a position where it won't harm anything uh, for quite a long time as some calculations showed as long as a hundred years so I think um, it's interesting that people are thinking about you know what ways can we use the station and I think there's other studies that are being pursued to explore that but for the reference concept here we didn't explore that option very good uh, another uh, question or comment from the floor anybody any anything at all yes sir So I have to write the final report for this workshop, and what I'd really like to see are some recommendations from this group, not just findings That's fine. on future steps and studies. And I had um, a couple of comments. Um, it seems like there's some potential uh, strengths of the expandable or deployable boom concepts relative to inflatables. So, you know, they might have less weight because you don't have an inflation system. They might have better spin dynamics. We really need to investigate that. So one potential recommendation would be to do some comparative studies of deployable boom concepts versus the inflatable concepts. And the other uh, thought was that the yo-yo D-spin could be used uh, with the um, mothership, uh, like uh, the <coughs> reference concept that Brian showed at the beginning. Uh, we've already captured the asteroid, and the uh, spacecraft goes to these wild uh, tumbling um, maneuvers. And so maybe we just uh, deploy a CubeSat off the back of the mothership, mothership and that would reduce some of the burden on the RCS. Um, I don't know if it trades from a mass standpoint. Are you, know, you saving propellant versus a CubeSat? But we should look into that. So yeah, we looked at yo-yos for uh, for de-spinning because we are um, planning to use all, uh, you know up to about 200 kilos of RCS propellant to do this job, and so that's not a trivial amount. Um, the concern we had was that the the yo-yo could get tangled in the solar panels and things like that, solar array uh, booms. Um, and so uh, if you consider all the possible spin states, um, it's not obvious that there's any place you can put a yo-yo that doesn't risk entanglement. And so that was why we decided. Because there definitely is a mass advantage. You could get down to you know five or six kilos of yo-yo um, to do this job with kilometers of tether. Um, but we could not see a way that in all the pathological spin states that you wouldn't risk uh, entangling the spacecraft. Well, uh, you know, um, our you know our driver. The que the question that um, Bo asks is is what about you know leaving and and pulling back and just leaving the yo yo and. Uh, the concern we had is uh, is the separable spacecraft cost, and so because our charter was to minimize the cost of this mission, um, w we elected not to uh, study in any detail any of the concepts that had a separable spacecraft. Uh, certainly, you can imagine a separable spacecraft that doesn't have solar array booms, or uh, certainly not large ones, uh, that that goes up and and does something. But the you know most people when they hear a second spacecraft, the cash register rings, you know, some large number of millions of dollars. And, uh, and, and whether that's true or not, that's the environment we live in, and that's what, you know, reviewers are going to think. And so uh, we did not put any effort into studying that. So just two more thoughts. Um, one, should we look at retractable solar arrays so we don't have to worry so much about breaking them? Um, we do have some concepts for large solar arrays that can be retracted and extended. So we need to trade off the risk of that versus, you know, the lower uh, loads on a retracted array. And then finally, I thought um, Brian Muirhead raised a good uh, point, and we really need to look at this 
other mission scenario where we pluck a boulder off the surface and most of our capture system concepts are for capturing the whole asteroid but we don't really have a lot of good ideas yet on how to pluck a rock off the surface other than the one that Brian showed so but yeah please come up with some recommendations those are just some sure ideas. No, I, th I think those are those are good inputs because um, one of the challenges I think the agency uh, sees is we've we've done a certain amount of analysis on our own but we'd also uh, this whole workshop has been intended to solicit ideas and concepts from industry and academia and, and the general public so every every idea that you're bringing forward I'm, I'm writing it down and I'm going to try and synthesize it together and I've worked with Chris uh, closely uh, before on a number of ideas and concepts so we're trying to capture everything that we can to bring uh, more informed um, analysis and decision making by the by the agency. So we appreciate everyone, everything y'all are bringing forward. Next comment. I'd, I'd like to speak to the a number of the comments that were just made. One about retracting solar arrays. Uh, already in in industry, one of the things we sometimes do if there's a Leonid swarm or meteorites approaching, we feather the arrays to uh, prevent present a minimum surface area towards the on towards the radiant to the meteor stream so there is a little bit of heritage in that direction already but the next thing one might think about is to have a sort of hinge mount underneath where the SATA is and just hinge the solar array out of the way and then the solar the SATA might not be able to be operable and it would rotate to a desired position and then be hinged out of the way and you wouldn't operate the SATA anymore until you hinged it back that would be one way to approach that. The one other thing is it I, I perceive a desire not to cause any structural deformation or change, physical change to the asteroid that we're trying to capture. But it's a sort of a mirror image of the notion of pick up a rock. What you might say is we've got this irregular object we're going to we're trying to capture here and it's got undesirable spin on it maybe what we need to do is to give it a shave um, as a somebody who wears a beard I can I can see this point um, <laughs> give it a shave before you uh, before you bring it home it, it needs a little cleanup and we'd like to bring it home pristine but the way it we found it but we'll, we'll take good pictures of it and and uh, then we're going to we're going to cut this irregular piece off maybe with a robot arm hitting it and maybe by doing that we also change its its mass properties that's one of the things in commercial spacecraft we concern ourselves with a lot of the mass properties of the object if you gave it a shave it would then be uh, all set up maybe for a, a more benign despin all right thank you marshall so in following up on what he said i think one thing that this group might sort of convey back upstream is that the object will in fact be changed how it will be changed is unclear uh, you know you can say well we'll try not to modify it or whatever but we don't really know it we might touch it and it falls into pieces you don't know and so uh, a question to relay upstream is is there anything that we really need to measure <laughs> before we touch it you know he just mentioned taking pictures. Well, is that is that one of the goals? Do you have to take pictures from all sides, you know, and so on? I mean, I, I think really the thing that this group could do is just sort of raise that flag and just say, hey, you know, things are going to be changed, and don't come to us afterwards and say, oh, but now we can't, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> now we can't determine this because you mucked with the surface. So one of the things we've done in some of the studies over the spring and summer is try to engage the planetary science community to understand what characteristics they want to be able to explore and understand so your, your input is right in line with some of the things they've been talking about yeah I mean and not even uh, in a sort of bigger picture you might even consider going to the lunar planetary science conference that's coming up or whatever right. and giving a presentation on that and saying you know what what should we be thinking about what's what's important here very good thank you next uh, commenter yeah, so my comment is uh, to Chris's point about uh, this alternative uh, mission concept to grab a boulder off the surface, and it, and it relates to the concept that uh, Brian Muir had presented as well. Um, I think it would be at a high level useful to think about these concepts that were presented today for that alternate 
um, approach, but I would put out a, a strong word of caution that the constraints are very different. If you're capturing an object that's in free space, uh, y you have a lot of flexibility, whereas if you're capturing an object that's fixtured to something else, uh, you're going to want a different kind of system. Specifically, you can't have isotropic compliance because that boulder is going to be uh, potentially much more massive than your spacecraft. So if you're slightly misaligned or if the boulder is bulging on one side, you're going to make contact with that first. That's going to impart loads to your spacecraft uh, that are going to cause you to tip over. So, you know, the work Dan is doing is going to tell us how well that boulder may be fixtured to the surface. Um, but if you look at, you know, the field of robotic manipulation, uh, they'll tell you it's a, it's a very different problem to pick up a ball on a table than it is to grab a, a ball-shaped doorknob that's fixtured to something. Um, so you need to consider that when we look at extending the concepts. Okay, very good. Thank you. Next comment, do we have anything more from the online? Um, you've asked a lot of questions today. You look like you're primed to ask a question or can make a comment. Um, it was, uh, as far as the tethers, go, the tethers go, would it be possible to use the spacecraft itself as the yo-yo and, you know, uh, pull it away and keep it tethered? And then not only would you not have to worry about anything getting entangled in, in solar arrays or things, but you'd also increase your lever arm, which I would think would make, w would uh, allow you to use less uh, propellant in trying to de-spin. And Brian, do you have anything to say about that? <coughs> Uh, we did not explicitly consider that, but um, uh, certainly that could be done, and you probably would reduce your um, propellant significantly by doing that. Um, but w once we were down in the 200 kilo, considering that we're carrying 10 tons of xenon, uh, we felt that you know that just the added complexity um, would you know would not be a good. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a lesser version of the of the separable spacecraft argument. Basically, that means that the the whole s s um, s uh, system that captures, the whole capture mechanism has to be uh, releasable, which we already have, uh, because if, if we decide, you know, later when the astronauts are uh, deploying it, if we decide we want to use the SEP system for something else, uh, we already have uh, SEP nuts and so on that can, that can pop off the whole capture system. But then you have a requirement that you be able to reel it back in on the tether and reconnect, redock with it. And so that's a whole new set of requirements and hardware that we uh, felt was just going to add. Uh, you know, the, the 200 kilos of RCS propellant seemed like, you know, it, it was small enough to, to um, not be worth considering the need to redock with the capture mechanism. All right, Mr. Enriquez. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring up the point uh, we really didn't discuss in detail. Um, if you could move a little closer to the mic. Sure. We didn't discuss in detail the uh, transition between uh, what, what we consider the soft capture phase or when we're trying to attach ourselves to the asteroid and what we call the final hard capture phase. I believe that that's one of the areas that we uh, need to be looked, uh, need, needs to be looked into more uh, in detail since we know that that transition is going to give rise to loads that can be imported either, either to the capture uh, system or to the spacecraft. And so that area uh, which always uh, gave us in our design of attachment systems for the space station uh, was the challenge. And so uh, we still have the challenge here, particularly now that the asteroid is uh, rotating. So. I wanted to bring that up as uh, an area that really needs to be looked into more closely. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? We've we got plenty of time, but I know that some people may want to go to lunch, so we don't want to unduly restrain you. I uh, wanted to uh, say again that we've um, the agency again has has uh, been seeking outside input. Uh, this is one mechanism, but they, there are other ways that the agency explores. There, there are different advisory bodies and then consultations with uh, with partners all around. So uh, don't feel like this is the only opportunity uh, to provide some inputs to NASA. And I think the, through the website and some of the other mechanisms, we've definitely got. Um, 
opportunities there and then the agency is going to continue to do its formulation work and explore not just this uh, area of capture systems but all of the dimensions of the of the mission as was um, stated and defined in the RFI and then of course Brian Muirhead's talked about the alternate mission concept which wasn't we didn't solicit any in, solicit inputs uh, via the RFI so there's other activities that may uh, uh, guide and influence uh, the work that we're doing here today um, anything more from the online car, uh, Pedro yes, I found questions now on Twitter and uh, there's a question for uh, let's see uh, Harold on uh, can the asteroid regolith be used to augment the end mass for very large asteroids basically gather mass <laughs> like a starfish a similar question on for Jeff could CubeSat eat some regolith, regolith and store in a small ballast bag prior to deploying the tether basically augmenting your end mass okay Howard if you could go first oh I just had a comment that there's a huge need for an EP tug in the earth uh, earth moon system uh, beyond NASA and so it's very possible to get other mission partners who could uh, contribute funding for that capability there is an issue of mission control so it has to be you know carefully crafted so that this mission isn't impacted but uh, this would have a lot of utility to those other areas okay so w the question that someone online had a question for you oh and that, for that's I'm yes sorry. I so was thinking say, about my question that's I, fine I, I say the part about for Howard again sorry about that real quick Pedro um, sure Okay, so it says, uh, would tether capture, well, hold on, can asteroid regolith be used to augment the end mass for very, lar very large asteroids? So, uh, let's see, uh, 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 others at JPL might want to comment on that. They're the ISRU kind of uh, gurus, but um, that would be a whole development beyond this. So, eventually, that's a goal, I believe, of this mission is to understand the a asteroids enough that that could be done. To put that level of risk into this mission would be, um, would probably put too much on this one mission. Okay, and then uh, we had a question, I think, for Jeff, uh, the part on the tether. Th th these two questions are, are related. It says, could CubeSat eat some regolith and store in a small ballast bag prior to deploying the tether? Technically, it could. Um, the D-spin, I think, is the square of the tether length, and the tether weighs nothing. It's basically dental floss. So uh, from a complexity standpoint, I don't think it would be worth it because you could just add another couple kilometers of tether if you wanted to at almost no penalty. Okay. It looks like we've got a. Uh, do you have a comment? Yeah. Could, if you got a comment, could you come to the microphone? Yeah, I think the uh, fellow before answered it pretty pretty well. I mean, uh, for for the tethers, if if I mean, when we were looking at having a spacecraft, you know, capture, uh, you know, the asteroid. That would be mass that you could. I mean, it's already connected, you know. So the added complexity, like the other fellow mentioned, is is uh, a lot lot more difficult. Okay. Thanks. So um, if I can maybe do a little recap just to kind of play back uh, some of the general conversation we've had uh, in this um, commenting session. Um, we've got uh, feedback from uh, on trying to understand, you know, how much uh, impact does the capture have on the asteroid? You know, what uh, provisions should we look at exploring to, to address that? Um, we know that uh, there was a variety of different objects uh, out there for consideration. Uh, some of the early analysis has been on uh, NEOs that are not binaries, uh, and but there's a whole other session that I think took place on the first day of the workshop back in September that looked at asteroid observation. And so I think one of the key elements of this entire initiative is to try and understand and characterize the asteroid targets that are being considered. So I'm hoping that that would yield the information that we would need to address uh, the question about the potential for a binary that we didn't didn't realize. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion overall about uh, how do you uh, work with a rubble pile or a dirt clod uh, asteroid. So any cap capture system uh, that's being envisioned is going to have to have enough flexibility or robustness to handle you know a range of potential materials. Um, under, um, hand, understanding the, the composition of the asteroid again I think is going to be a big part of the observation campaign. Um, Chris Moore brought forward the idea that we do need to explore 
uh, some of these areas in greater depth and I think we've certainly got a great starting point uh, for pursuing that so I'm happy to add that uh, into the presentation Chris that we'll be making tomorrow to at least propose that uh, as a forward forward plan um, I think uh, those are the those are the main things um, obviously we talked more about the yo-yo effect and the and the tethers Scott you had a comment about uh, tethers and the uh, changing mass properties that we would expect in a rubble pile so say we cast the net or the bag around it and then start to do the uh, the tether despend uh, despend I would presume that the forces in the bag are going to start changing the shape of that rubble pile how can the tether system accommodate for that Okay. Goes out to the tether guys. Okay. Yes, yeah, so Brian, you have a comment? Uh, I'd just like to emphasize for the group that the forces in all of this are very small. Um, you know, a, f a few newtons, you know, a one pound of force is enough to do everything you need to do on this mission. Um, you don't need significant forces in in the terms that most aerospace engineers are, you think of large forces so so we hear people talk about oh you know it needs to be strong and so on it doesn't really need to be very strong when you work out the forces uh, you know most of you probably already done a lot of the back of the envelope sophomore physics on this and and if you just you know with just a little bits of force you can de-spin these things over hours which is good enough to to solve the problem so um, more more key is the is the point that I tried to make and that Dan Shears made um, that that this material could be way under one psi compressive and and shear strength and as a result you know that's why we ended up with these capture bags that are inflated to much less than one psi something comparable to or less than the the shear and compressive strength of the uh, of the regolith material. Now once you compress it, of course, it, you add strength. So when you confine the thing from all sides, uh, it'll tend to be more cohesive than it would just in free space. Um, and s but as long as we, um, see, as we inflate the bags, we watch the <coughs> IMU of the spacecraft. <coughs> and if the IMU says the spacecraft is not doing what we thought it would do for example if the center mass is slightly off from where we thought the center mass was we adjust the inflation pressures so that we don't uh, number one we don't want to trigger adverse you know excessive forces on the spacecraft solar arrays um, but number two we don't you know we want to take that into account in the future dynamic you know prediction of where we're going to be where we're going to fire our RCS thrusters to start detumbling and despinning things like that but we have 22 Newton thrusters which actually turn out to be you know large you know for what we really need to apply um, in terms of the despin forces so we're, we're going to try not to modify the shape of the um, of the asteroid uh, and the yo-yo would be pr probably have even less force than you know than the 22 Newton R RCS thrusters so the once you start to deploy the yo-yo uh, if you went and did it that way you would do it slowly so that again over a period of, of hours or days you know a day or a couple of days uh, you could despin the thing easily and and with just you know one pound of force thanks Brian really appreciate that all right well we're uh, I think we've done a, a great job here this morning of trying to canvas uh, all of all of y'all I think there's a lot of uh, areas in which I think different folks have have brought their in their expertise and their perspectives uh, certainly the industry uh, partners have been uh, very good in sharing what their flight experience has been and how they've applied their technologies to other domains uh, we've had some representatives from academic community uh, sharing what their experience and then uh, NASA personnel from the study teams also shared their experience so I think we've got a good broad cross-section of uh, folks taking a look at this problem uh, we really appreciate all of the responses uh, to the RFI and particularly y'all who are able to join us here uh, today uh, what I would invite you to do is to uh, participate in some of the sessions this afternoon there's a crew a crude system session I think is it going to be in this room Pedro um, okay so look at your program to figure out I think we've got three sessions this afternoon two to three sessions some here and maybe one in the lecture hall and then tomorrow 
uh, between 10 and noon they're slated to have a, a summary or out brief of each of the sessions so I'll be doing the out brief uh, from this session and um, if you want to uh, get some additional thoughts to me between now and then um, I'm andre.j.sylvester at nasa.gov uh, if you want to send me a quick email note I'd be happy to at least respond to you but again I'd like to Thank everyone for their participation. Uh, enjoy maybe a little bit longer lunch break. I think we the whole activity starts up again at 1.30 this afternoon. And because of the bus system we've got, I would say give yourself some extra time uh, in getting getting back here. Allow for the transit time of the, of the bus. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming, and thanks for participating. <laughs>